Welcome to Banyan Books, Branches of Wisdom. Celebrating the joy of bright ideas and heartful lifelong learning. Branches of Wisdom is a series of intimate conversations with the world's most influential authors and visionaries. We explore spirituality and the human mind, ecology and culture. Most episodes are recorded with a live audience. You can join our live events and submit questions to your favorite guests. Check out our upcoming schedule at banyan.com. Since 1970, Banyan Books has been a rich oasis at the crossroads of wisdom and philosophy, offering resources for humanity's evolving paths. We're a locally owned, independent bookstore in the heart of Vancouver's Kitsilano neighborhood. Visit us in person or shop online at banyan.com. Please subscribe follow, like, and leave your reviews for the podcast. And now, enjoy. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Branches of Wisdom, the Banyan Books podcast. I'm your host, Ross McKeechee, and really delighted today to have our special guest, Karen Casey, Now, before we get started with her introduction, Banyan Banyan Books acknowledges that although we have people joining us from all over the world for these live streaming events, the physical location of Banyan Books and sound is on the traditional and unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Today, we at Banyan Books are delighted to be joined by Karen Casey for a special event celebrating the 40th anniversary release of her beloved best-selling classic, Each Day a New Beginning, Daily Meditations for Women. First published in 1982, Karen Casey's signature and genre-defining work broke ground at the first as the first daily meditation book for women in alcoholism recovery. 40 years later, Over 4 million copies have been sold, and people around the globe continue to to return to this renowned classic for motivation and reflection. This new edition features a foreword by New York Times bestselling author Marianne Williamson and an updated introduction by the author. With more than two dozen books to her credit and over 7 million books sold worldwide, Karen is still writing taking one day at a time and connecting with groups all over the world. Among her other best-selling classics, titles include The Promise of a New Day, 52 Ways to Live the Course in Miracles, Let Go Now, and Codependence and the Power of Detachment. In her foreword to this new edition, Marianne Williamson says the following, Each Day a New Beginning, was first published in the early 1980s, the same period when I began giving lectures on A Course in Miracles. Those were days when spiritual seeking outside the confines of institutional religion was somewhat unique, even exotic. What Karen found in Alcoholics Anonymous and I found in the course was a path to God that wasn't waylaid by religious dogma. What grew from Karen's hunger to know God was a compilation of thoughts and reflections that became this book, a publishing wonder that has touched the lives of millions. In a world of falsehood, it's a friendly reminder of what's deeply true. You can't read it in the morning and not be prepared for a better day. For those of you who would like to learn more about Karen Casey and her work, you can visit her website, which is womens-spirituality. Dot com. Banyan Books community, please join me in a very warm welcome for Karen Casey. Hello, Karen. Welcome. Hi, thank you. So nice to have you with us. And I'm so happy to, to have been invited. It's quite a pleasure to have met you and to be here. So in the opening of the book, in the new preface for this 40th anniversary edition, You share about your own search and struggle to know God and that it was, quote unquote, paramount when you first entered the 12 step rooms. 
wondering if you can tell us about your own yearning to connect with and know God and how that led you into the process of writing and eventually to the birth of this book. Oh, I would really be happy to, Ross. You know, <clears throat> when I, I really did not grow up um, with a religious kind of background. And um, it wasn't that my family wasn't Christian, I think, <laughs> but it wasn't, it really wasn't the kind of family that we sat and said prayers before a meal, except maybe the big Thanksgiving meal where everybody was together. And then uh, I had a, an uncle who often drank too much. And, and my grandmother would say, hey, George, how about saying grace before the meal? And he would kind of go on and on and on. And that was really kind of my experience with grace before a meal. But when I came into AA, I realized that everybody seemed to have a connection that I just didn't have. And I would come to a meeting and I would feel in the, in the presence of all these people, I would feel a connection, but then I would leave and go home to my apartment and the connection would be gone. And I, um, it troubled me greatly. And I wanted that same connection that other people had. And, um, and, you know, really, ultimately, uh, and it took me a little bit of a journey to get here, but ultimately, um, I sat down and just started writing. I, had, I was in, at that time in graduate school working on my doctorate at the University of Minnesota. And I had discovered in graduate school that writing for me um, was like falling off a log. I, I had no expectation that that would be my experience with writing. As an undergraduate, I wasn't a particularly great student because I was such a party girl. And when I applied to graduate school, which was after my first marriage had ended, they turned me down because my grades weren't very good. And they said, take some classes and then reapply. And I did, and, and I did very well, so I got in. And then lo and behold, you know, I, the very first class I took, we had to write a paper a week. And I thought, oh my gosh, I wonder how that's going to feel. Well, I tell you, it felt amazingly good. So I knew that somehow writing gave me a sense of comfort and well-being. Now, by the time I reached writing my dissertation for my doctorate, I quit drinking, but not up until that time. Right before then, I was still drinking. And then I knew somehow that writing a 300-page dissertation wouldn't probably ever get completed if I was still sitting at my, because I was writing longhand, sitting at my kitchen table drinking a glass of Jack Daniels every night. And um, so at any rate, I, I got sober. And like I say, I didn't feel that presence. And then I thought, you know, I think I'll just start writing and see what happens. And, and I, I, I had this big old brown recliner that my father-in-law, because I had a new husband by then, and uh, uh, my father-in-law had given me. And I would sit there at night and, and I didn't have any sense of what I might say or write. It was as though the words came in the same way they came when I sat and wrote papers. I never outlined, had never outlined anything in my life. In fact, on my dissertation, Ross, my, my major professor said, why don't we look at your outline before you begin writing? And I said, well, gee, I don't have one. And he said, oh, <laughs> oh really? I've, I've never had a a PhD student without an outline before. And I said, well, I, uh, I, I don't know how to write one. I mean, I was teaching writing at the University of Minnesota, but I, I've never written an outline. So my writing in that big old brown recliner was much the same way. I would just sit and it would comfort me. And, and I didn't reread what I was writing. I mean, it wasn't, that wasn't the intent. I never planned to write something for anybody else. It was to calm my nerves. It was to feel a connection. How it became a book 
is that at the time, after I had finished my, my PhD, I ended up getting a job at Hazelden. Uh, Hazelden was a drug and treatment center. I actually had wanted to get a job there as a writer and they said, no, 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 we don't hire writers. So I, they did hire me for a different kind of job. Um, but the president of Hazelden, Harry Swift, took an interest in my journey, um, my recovery journey. And he said, you know, how are you doing? And I said, well, you know, I mean, okay and not okay. I said, I, I struggled to feel that presence. And so I started to, I told him about what I was doing, that I was sitting and writing amazingly. And I, I have grown to believe that everything happens perfectly in our lives. You know, everything happens perfectly. And he said, well, would you mind sharing with me some of those things you've been writing? And I said, oh, okay. I was kind of taken aback, but I said, okay. So I brought in um, the journaling I had done and he had it for uh, a few days. And then he called me and said, would you mind coming to my office? I'd like to talk to you about something. And I thought, uh oh, <laughs> I mean, this is the president of the organization. <laughs> What's what next? And he said, you know, Karen, I really think that what you have here is a book that would be helpful to other women. And I encourage you to finish this. Finish doing what you're doing because women need a book like this. You're not the only person who has trouble feeling a connection to God. And that's how it came about. It, it was, and, and I'm sometimes embarrassed to say, you know, to women who have said to me, gosh, that book has helped me so much. I, I don't say to them, actually, I never meant to write it for you. <laughs> I don't. So any of you women listening, please realize that it wasn't that I didn't mean to write it for you, but that wasn't my search. My search was for my own soul, for my own peace of mind, that it was helpful to others and that, and that Harry Swift said this book would be helpful was magical. And so, but I got to tell you this one little story. The men there at Hazelden, and, um, and, and, I, and they were good men. They were in recovery. They were in charge of publishing and production. And they said, we don't need a book for women. And Harry Swift said, oh, yes, we do. And they said, well, okay, so we'll get 10,000 printed and we'll never sell them, but we'll print 10,000 just to make you happy. Well, those first 10,000 were sold, of course, before they ever even reached the warehouse. So that was, um, that, that was amazing. And so when I think that now it has been read by 4 million people, I, it, it's, it just astounds me at the way God works in our lives. And that's all I can think that there is a plan. There's a plan for everything. And um, my life was full of bumps all along the way, Ross. And yet here I am today talking to you a whole bunch of books later, still working a long-term recovery program in AA and Al-Anon and having an absolutely amazing life. I'm wondering if you, it is amazing at how it happened. And I know there's some other incredible stories that happened along the way too. So I'm going to just compartmentalize that for now, because you just mentioned Alcoholics Anonymous and Al-Anon. And I'm just wondering, you write in your introduction to each day a new, a new beginning that the program has given me roots where none existed before. It has given me courage to dare to do that, which I shuddered before in years gone by. It has given me a sense of belonging to the human race, I no longer feel that I'm outside of the fishbowl looking in. Can you just try and tell us a little bit about your first experiences? I think you went to Al-Anon first. And I went to Al-Anon in 1974. You know, after, as I said, after my first marriage had ended, it was a 12 year marriage to a, to a man who struggled with alcohol too. He was also in graduate school. I didn't start graduate school until after we divorced, but um, he was in graduate school and struggled greatly. I had a terrible alcohol problem. And, um, 
And when, when we split up, I had a very poor chooser. I kept choosing one bad partner after another. And guess what? They were all alcoholic. You know, I mean, it's not surprising because I too was alcoholic. I just was such a high functioning alcoholic. It was easy to ignore the fact that alcohol was my number one choice. I mean, it was how my day began and how my day ended. But um, so at any rate, I was involved in a relationship with somebody who ended up in treatment. And his counselor said to me, you know, you've got a lot of wrinkles in your forehead, Karen. And it was like, huh? And he said, that's a sign to me that you need to go to al <laughs> and, and it was like, oh, really? And so in 1974, I walked into my first Al-Anon meeting in Minneapolis. And, um, and I, I got to tell you, Ross, and all of the listeners here, it was the first time in my life I walked into a gathering of strangers, men and women, that I felt absolutely at home. I had never felt comfortable in a room of strangers before. And even though I didn't know any of them, I felt like I knew them all as I heard them speak, because I knew that our, so much of our story was the same. And um, the only thing that troubled me that first night was that on the wall, and if you've ever been to an AA or an Al-Anon meeting, on the wall were the steps and traditions. And and of course, God gets mentioned. And, and I thought, oh, no, this is not going to work because, you know, it's like, I, I, I'm a graduate student. You know, we don't believe in God, you know. I mean, somebody ought to work it on a PhD. You know, we don't mess around. There's no God in my life. Well, I tell you, I didn't, I didn't, I realized that it didn't mean I had to believe in God at that moment. What I could believe in was the fact that all these people had a sense of well-being and comfort and hope. And I had never had that before. And they sent me home that first night. And this is such a funny little thing, I think. They sent me home that first night with the little daily book, that a meditation book that Al-Anon people read. It was the only one that existed for Al-Anon at that time. And it's, and in fact, the date was on the inside, 1974. And it was one day at a time in Al-Anon. And I went home and I sat down on my couch, poured myself a drink, lit a cigarette, and read the book from cover to cover and thought, oh, I've got this. There's no, this is no big deal. I've got this figured out. And I went back to the meeting the next week because they had said, like we always say at AA and Al-Anon, now come back. I went back that next week and they said, well, now how are you? And I said, oh, I'm just fine. I finished the book. And um, they all just chuckled and said, now it's a good idea if you start over and just read it one page at a time. So, you know, I, um, I knew that there was something in a 12-step meeting that I had never experienced before. Now, I didn't, my own journey into AA didn't happen until about a year and a half later. And again, that was the result of being in a counseling session, again, with another wrong choice. I mean, I was so good at making wrong choices. I didn't, I didn't make any right choices until after I was in AA for a while. And the best right choice I made was the man I'm married to now. <laughs> but, but at any rate, um, I was in a counseling session and it was couples counseling and there were six sets of couples and I was so codependent and probably all your listeners know about codependency, but codependency is when we let the behavior of others define who we are. And I was so codependent and I was always trying to be the primary person and take somebody hostage so that they would think I was absolutely the best thing that ever happened to them. And we were in this counseling session, but guess what? This probably doesn't surprise you. For six weeks, he never showed up. And all six weeks that we were in that group, every week I went 
with even a better excuse for why he wasn't there than the week before, because I didn't want it to make me look bad. And that last week, the counselor said, you know, Karen, I don't really know if you have a relationship. And it was like, what? Because all the rest of them had told their stories. And so she said, tell us about yourself. So I started to tell a little bit about who I was, not thinking I was revealing anything really about my own alcohol use. And she stopped me. And she said, you know, Karen, I think that you have a problem with alcohol. I think what you need is Alcoholics Anonymous. And it was like, what? May 24th, 1976, two people from that group met me and took me to my first AA meeting. I did not go to that meeting with any thought that I would never take another drink. In fact, I had a big bottle of Jack Daniels at home. But I walked into that meeting and something changed completely. I looked around. It was a room of 200 people, at least, men and women, probably more men than women. And, and actually, to tell you the truth, I looked around and I thought, and they were all men and women about my age in their 30s and 40s. And I thought, oh, my God, Karen, this is where you should have been all along instead of sitting on those bar stools. Look at all these good looking men here. You know, <laughs> why didn't you show up here earlier? But at any rate, I had exactly the same feeling in an overall way that I had had at that Al-Anon meeting, that there was that comfort and then, as I said, I would go home and feel alone again. And that's when the writing began, because I felt alone. And, you know, it's kind of one of those things where the, the rest is history. I mean, one book ultimately led to another book, and then another book, and then another book. And none of that was on my radar screen. And, you know, I, I think that that's what's so true for all of us. We just don't, we don't realize that. I, I choose to believe, and maybe that not everybody maybe listening believes this, but I really choose to believe that there is a trajectory for my life. And I only need to know a little bit of it at a time. And I have been guided. And I haven't even realized I have been guided. I didn't know what was happening. I just got nudged in one direction or another. And so here I sit, you know, almost, well, actually counting the years in al -Anon, almost 50 years later, Ross, wow. you know? And, um, and my life has been rich in so many ways. And I've met such incredible people and I wouldn't, and I've had ups and downs and I've struggled with depression, clinical depression. And I've been on medication for that for a number of years. And there isn't anything in my life I would change because I know that everything has happened just as it should. That's wonderful. Karen, you mentioned before about, you said at the time you didn't have a, a, a good chooser and you didn't, you said you, you didn't make any good choices until a certain point in your life. Um, one of the, one of the days in, in the book, each day, a new beginning, it's from uh, February 19th, page 67. It's all about choices. And, and I'm going to quote you here. You say, I need not worry about today's opportunities for decision-making. I will listen to those around me. I will seek guidance in the messages coming to me. I will make the choices I need to today. I'm wondering if we can talk a little bit about choices, because I know for myself, sometimes I can end up belaboring a seem seemingly small choice or get paralyzed. Sometimes I can be too casual about the impacts of a choice as well. So I'm wondering, what's your experience with the power of choice? What do you, what do you tell people about that? Well, you know, what I tell people, and I, I've had over all of these years, I've certainly had a lot of sponsees too, and we talk about choices a lot at 
both Al-Anon and AA meetings. And I've come to believe that that actually there aren't any wrong choices mm. that we we may kind of get off track with the choice but we'll always be nudged back on track and i do think that our that and and i i had that open today too because believe it or not i've started reading this book again every day so i read that myself this morning and i really believe that that every choice is offering us a, an opportunity um, an opportunity to move in one direction or another. But I think that our choices are really spirit-given, God-given. They are um, meant for us, for our exploration. And I think that our choices are what bring us into the encounters that we really need to have with other people. I one of the one of my um, strong beliefs is that we don't have any accidental encounters in our lives. That every encounter we have is quite intentional. Um, that we meet who we need to meet, and in every meeting, we'll have a choice on how to how to behave. And I have come to believe that the best choice we can always make in any encounter is to simply be kind and gentle. And that way we will be able to offer the kind of comfort that somebody else may need. And every time we offer that kind of comfort to somebody else, guess what? It comforts us too. So I think that our choices are so perfectly laid out for us you know when I think back on on my childhood or, or you know when I think back uh you know I, t I had my first job when I was 12 I took a job at Columbian Park well I had been a babysitter before then every young girl is a babysitter but then I took a job at Columbian Park in Lafayette Indiana where I where I grew up and I sold tickets on the kiddie ride. And one of the things that that really taught me was how it felt to actually in, interact with young kids and their parents, how it felt to earn some money, you know, how it felt to already become somewhat independent. So as simple as that choice seemed, it actually prepared me for then, when, by the time I reached high school, having what was kind of a big, de big, big damn deal, I got a job downtown in Lafayette at a department store. And it was really uh, a, a place that I worked for a number of years then. And in that job, I ended up meeting people who really introduced me to so many ideas that I wouldn't have ever come across otherwise. And so I think that that there isn't any choice that we have that isn't somehow opening another door for us. And even though I've sometimes thought about my first marriage to Bill, you know, was that a bad choice? You know, it's like I think that at the time, Ross, my there were probably members of my family, including my parents, who watched him drink excessively, who thought that was a bad choice. Um, but you know what? If I hadn't had made that choice, I wouldn't have ended up in Minneapolis. And even though the marriage itself, we struggled and there were so many painful periods, that ultimately led me to the opportunity to go to get a PhD. That had never been on my radar screen. Me, I mean, I was an elementary teacher. I had never thought about a PhD in teaching at the university, you know? And so that door, that opening that door to marrying him led me to an opportunity that I wouldn't have had otherwise. And then when that marriage ended, ultimately, even though I had, as you said, made one bad choice after the other, but were they really? Because they just kept opening the door that got me closer and closer to Al-Anon and then Alcoholics Anonymous. 
And that got me closer and closer to the man I'm married to today, Joe. And, you know, and, and it got me closer and closer to the opportunities I had to ultimately publish this book and a multitude of other books. So every choice walks us up to a door that is ready to be opened. That's what I believe so firmly. And it comforts me because I believe that even as I have aged, the same will be true. This is not going to change. This is how life evolves. So I guess I'll play the devil's advocate a bit here. What do, and maybe it's there's just a, a sim, it's a similar vein, but you can frame it in a different way. What do you let's say in in Alcoholics Anonymous world, and you're advising someone who's consistently making the bad choice, and it looks like they could be drinking themselves to death. They're causing harm to their family, that kind of thing. For someone like that, what would you tell them about choices? You know, I would say to, to a person like that, and I certainly have crossed paths with people like that who continue to relapse. And, um, and what I say is we're always here when you're ready for us. You know, you cannot decide for somebody else that it's really, you can model for others what life without alcohol is like. But unfortunately, all we can say is we're here to help you when you are ready for the help we have to offer. And I would encourage somebody like that to seek the help of a treatment center or a counselor, get some kind of professional guidance too. But, you know, I, I, um, when I see somebody making the same poor choice over and over again, what I, what I do is tell them about my story with choices and my belief that our choices are our opportunities. And every time they have a choice, it can have gone one way or another. And maybe they turned right when they could have turned left. And that if they just rethink the choice, they can always backtrack. They can always say, let me try again. You know, I have watched people in all of these years in AA. I have really, Russ, I have watched people who've gone through treatment 18, 20 times who finally have decided they want the sober life. So I don't think we ever give up on anybody. And we just say, we're always going to be here for you. We're always the choice you can make when you're ready. We won't go away. We'll always welcome you back. So, okay, I'm hearing you. It's really about respecting that nobody can choose for anybody else. And you That's just- That's really right. And, yeah. and, and it's, it's loving people wherever they are. And that's what's really important too, is to convince people when they're in that space, we'll never turn our back on you. We're always the place that will welcome you back. You know, you always have a home here with us. Right. So I guess the natural uh, progression for me to ask you about now is around codependence and boundaries and detachment because i think if i'm if i'm someone who's not able to respect a loved one's power of choice and I, that creates a codependent situation no yes yes it does and and you know one of them probably one of the uh, books that i wrote that i feel um the the best about uh, because i think it has helped so many people and it continues and it, the writing of it was so helpful to me is let go now embracing detachment because it really is about knowing that we have to just respect other people and the choices, the journey they need to make, but we also need to continue to love them wherever they are on their journey and not try to, not try to micromanage anybody else's life. And that's what codependents so often do. You know, I know in my codependency, I felt, I, and I can remember in my first marriage, 
th this is an example. We would, you know, Bill was in graduate school and, and scholarly, and I was an elementary teacher. And he always, I think, kind of looked down on me because I was only an elementary teacher. And we would go to a movie or we would both read the same book. And he would, he would ask me what I thought. And honestly, Ross, I would rack my brain to try to figure out what did he think so that I could say the same thing. Because I really wanted, I mean, and it's the insanity of that, but I wanted to, in fact, because I felt so defined by him anyway, I wanted to be approved of him because I so feared rejection. So codependency gets all mixed up with wanting to hold somebody hostage, not wanting to be rejected by them, wanting to make sure that we meet all of their needs. Uh, wanting to really make sure that we're in charge of their journey. I mean, I can remember, uh, as I had said before, his alcohol issues were more, um, I don't want to say he was a, a worse alcoholic than me, but I was, I functioned more comfortably, I think. And, and I, I would try to hide all of the things that were happening as a result of his excessive alcohol use so other people wouldn't see it because of how, not only how it would make him look, but how it would make me look for being with him. So codependency wears many coats. You know, it, it, there are many ways to look at codependency, but for sure getting a healing from codependency is really about the learning what detachment is all about instead of being attached to somebody else, learning how to detach. And detach doesn't mean we turn away in anger. It just means we step aside and let somebody else have whatever journey they need to have and love them on that journey, not try to control that journey, but let them know that we're not going to discard them. We're going to be there so that they can make the journey that they're here to make. We're all here to make whatever journey we need to make. And, you know, I think that it, 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 detachment, codependency isn't, isn't just part of the alcoholism syndrome. You know, this whole world is full of codependence. I often think, I really often think, you know, if everybody went to Al-Anon and learned about detachment versus attachment, this entire universe would be filled with healthier people. And, uh, and so the, the book that I wrote of 200 essays, Let Go Now, Embracing Detachment, is really about learning how to walk side by side in a loving way, but not stepping in front of somebody. Karen, one of the one of the threads, I'm jumping a bit, one of the threads that runs through your work is the idea that there is, and I'm quoting you here, there is never anything to change but your own perspective. Um, and the power of changing our own mind. I'm wondering, do you remember when this realization landed for you? Was there a particular moment when that really sunk in for you? You know, I'm, I'm trying to think, you know, I wrote a book, Change Your Mind and Your Life Will Follow, uh, a few years ago. And, um, and I know that, that what had occurred to me was that, um, that it was all about how I chose to see things. You know, and that my opportunity to see things differently, and that really was something that I gleaned from the study of A Course in Miracles. You know, I have been a student of A Course in Miracles for 35 years. I have um, facilitated A Course in Miracles group for 35 years. I've written a couple books on The Course in Miracles. One is 52 Ways to Live The Course in Miracles. But in the course, it talks about um, your own perspective. 
you know, and, and, you know, it, it talks, I mean, one of the taglines in a way of the course is a miracle is simply a shift in perception. That's what a miracle is. And so that really, there was a softening of my heart when I realized that I could be in any kind of a situation that felt uh, extremely tense or, or there was a struggle going on. And if I just said to myself, help me see this differently, help me change my perspective, everything about that situation seemed to change. And I could feel it in my body. My shoulders would relax. And so it became so evident to me that, you know, if you change your mind about things, everything in your life will change too. And that's what gave rise to that particular book, but it really came from how my own mind had changed as a result of being a student of A Course in Miracles. And, you know, A Course in Miracles, which is such a fascinating spiritual pathway, I'm, I don't know uh, your familiar, familiarity with it, but um, it was scribed by a woman named Helen Shookman in the um, 60s. And she, um, she was a colleague of a man named Bill Thetford, and they were both psychologists at the um, Columbia University Medical School. And they had a very acrimonious relationship and they had the same kind of relationship with the whole department. And Bill said to Helen after one meeting with everybody involved, he said, these, these meetings are just making me crazy. There's got to be another way. And much to the amazement of Bill, and I think Helen too, she said, I'll help you find it. Because that wasn't the kind of thing that was, would normally have come out of her mouth. And a few weeks later, she called him up at home at night and said, oh, Bill, I think I must be losing my mind. I heard a voice. And he said, what? She said, I heard a voice and it said, this is A Course in Miracles, please take notes. And she was deeply frightened. I mean, here she is a psychologist hearing a voice. And he said to her, Helen, take notes, write down what you hear, bring them to the office tomorrow. For seven years, she wrote down every night what she heard and that became the text and the workbook and the manual for teachers of A Course in Miracles. And, and you know, the, the thing about the course that I, I've always been touched by is that it's really about learning how to be more loving. It's learning, it's, it, it's all about being told that we really have not been doing life the right way. Jesus, however you want to think about Jesus, believing that actually we've been not kind and loving to one another in this life. We have been critical and demanding and taken retribution against people. And our job here is to be loving. And so that's really the emphasis of the course. And that's really the emphasis of my book, Change Your Mind and Your Life Will Follow. And that's really the emphasis of what the miracle being a shift in, per in perception is. It's like, how can I see this more lovingly? And everything changes when you make that decision. That's wonderful. And we actually, we have some nice questions coming in from the audience. And the first one I have here is about Course in Miracles for you uh, from Jacqueline, who says, where in A Course in Miracles are you in your life today? Well, you know, that's, I, I guess I would say, you know, I, I have been studying it for so many years and facilitating a class. And I've been through the book probably 30 times. Uh, and where I am is uh, always, 
always in awe of what I read each day because it's as though it's, it is fresh to me every day. You know, the Course speaks to us in such a gentle, loving, kind way, and it's not always easy. You know, the Course is not always easy to understand. But, you know, one of the things that I have thought about so many times, you know, if, if the Course, and the Course really consists of not that many principles overall, uh, probably you could name 15 or 20 total principles, although it starts out by saying there are 50, but ultimately some of those are repetitious. But the Course has a few real specific ideas, like love is letting go of fear. And, um, and if, you, um, if you just focus, if you did a book that just focused on those principles in about 20 pages, a person would read that book and put it aside and say, I'm done. I've, I, you know, I'm done with that. I think that one of the reasons the book is, is um, so much more difficult and so much more complicated to read and it makes you need to reread it again and again and again and you don't ever feel done it's kind of like reading a daily meditation book you know I mean you read it once and that doesn't mean you never pick it up and read it again you know that's the beauty you're at a different place the next time you read that particular page so it means something new to you and I think the same thing is true of the course. And, you know, I heard a wonderful story many years ago, Ken Wapnick, who was a great Course in Miracles teacher. And he's passed on now, but he did workshops for years. And, and uh, in one of his workshops, somebody raised their hand and said, you know, would you please explain blah, blah, blah to me? And he went over to their page, to their book and picked it up and tore out the page and said, here. Now, don't worry about that page. Sometime later, you'll understand what that page says. And, and, you know, that's really kind of the beauty of it. It's like, don't sweat it. It'll get repeated in a new way. And so that's how I keep looking at the course. You know, I don't know it backwards and forwards. And I don't intend to ever know it that way. And I don't care if I don't know it that way. I know that it has made me a more loving, kind person. And that's the reason I keep turning to it. Thank you so much. And, and thanks to Jacqueline for that question. Um, there's a really lovely comment here from Deanna Alcorn Smith uh, that I just wanted to share with you. She says, Karen, you are my inspiration. Each day a new beginning was my daily reader when I got sober in 1984. And I've purchased at least 10 copies of Change Your Mind and Your Life Will Follow. <laughs> and given them away to sponsees. Last year, I published a daily devotional in New Thought Spirituality, a year on the journey. Your words served as the epigraph for three of those pages. Thank you for your permission to use those quotes when we spoke in July. I don't have a question. I just wanted to say my wholehearted thank you to you for your life-changing work. Oh, thank you, Deanna. Thank you so much. And I remember our communication, so thank you. We've got another question here from Helen, who says, what do you recommend as a first step to figuring out what is ahead in my trajectory? You know, I don't know that we even need to try to figure out any of that. You know, I think that it will become apparent to us. You know, we will get the nudge in the direction we need to go. Um... I think that that I one of the things that I have loved in my life is to realize that I can look back on so many years and see how everything led to something else. And probably one of the things that that you might do, Helen, is look back on your life at things that happened that brought you to this point and and just know that. A comforting idea, a comforting, something comforting will present itself to you next. And be courageous and move in that direction. Because I think our trajectory is always meant 
to bless us. It's always meant to give us the opportunities we need to have. I, I believe firmly that we should not have any fear in regard to where we're going because we are being taken care of. We will not be led someplace and left on our own. I, I Like I told you all to begin with, I didn't have a spiritual belief system uh, when I was younger. I didn't come into the rooms of AA and Al-Anon with a spiritual belief system. I certainly am comforted by one now. And I think I had to simply be ready for it. And I look back on the trajectory and I can see how every single experience truly was opening the right door for me now. And wherever you are right now, Helen, you have been prepared. I don't think we are ever unprepared for what's going to come next. So I think you simply need to trust that what comes next on your journey is what's right for you. Thanks and thanks Helen for that question. There's another one here from Elena who says, what do you do or words of wisdom do you use to remind yourself to let go with things you have no control over? Well, you know, I, that's really, those, you've said the words right there, let go. I use those words again and again, you know, or I, I pick up and, and I mean, it, this maybe sounds crazy to you, but I, I pick up, <laughs> let go now, embracing detachment, and I'll, I'll just open it at random. I also wrote a book called uh, A Life of My Own, which is a daily meditation book about, uh, for codependence. And uh, I'll, I'll open that too. Uh, you know, I, I, I just know that I am not in this life to take charge of somebody else. And that hasn't always been easy for me. You know, I think a lot of us feel like my, our own lives would be easier if, other, if somebody else, if he just did what I wanted me to do, if I wanted him to do, or if she just said what I wanted her to say. And and, you know, that's, that never allows for an honest kind of give and take. So letting go is truly a decision that we simply have to make. And I, I remember saying to sponsees in past years, you know, if you feel like it's hard to let go of somebody, truly, just don't turn your heart aside, but turn your body aside. Just look in a different direction. Because we, you're not here to make sure they do it your way. That's not your role. Your role is to love them where they are. And to keep modeling behavior that you feel good about. And we never ultimately feel good about trying to control somebody else who doesn't want to be controlled. You know, they don't feel good about it. And certainly we don't in retrospect. You know? We're getting close to our time. We've got about five minutes left, but I've got, I've got another question for you that I thought would be a good one to close with. I just want to thank our, our live audience for all of your great questions and for being here and, and helping us to create these events together. We've, of course, been speaking with Karen Casey about her 40th anniversary edition of Each Day a New Beginning, Daily Meditations for Women. Four million copies, over four million copies of this book have been sold. It's really incredible. Now, Karen, much of your work is targeted specifically towards women and girls. And I was looking through the list of your books on your website, and you have one called Be Who You Want to Be which is for directed at young, young women, young girls. And you write in the description for that book, for a vast majority of girls in this country, there comes an age at which self-esteem, self-assurance, equilibrium, and confidence fly out the window. Maybe it's hormones, maybe it's culture, social media, or maybe it's just called growing up. Whatever the cause, it's real. 
Some girls turn in their own fashion to the same addictive solutions as their elders, compulsive behavior, either in the form of alcohol, drugs, food, or something equally destructive. I'm wondering, can we just talk about what you see as the unique challenges that young women face in this culture and what words of inspiration or wisdom would you want to leave the youth with? Yeah, you know, I, it is, it's harder to be a young girl today than it was when I was a young girl, that's for sure. And I think that social media today is poisoning the minds of young people. And, um, you know, I guess I want to say to young girls and, and young boys too, um, but particularly young girls, you know, believe in yourself. Know that you are okay however you are and wherever you are. And if you're in a situation where it feels like the people you're around um, are, are not treating you kindly or not appreciating you, Know that people treat others the way they feel about themselves. And, you know, I think that that was one of the most important things I learned in my life. Not, I don't think I learned it as a young girl, but I've learned it as an adult that we treat others the way we feel. So somebody who treats me in a really crappy way, they're not feeling good about themselves or they wouldn't treat me that way. So if you're a young girl and your friends are suddenly acting towards you in ways that feel unkind, keep in mind that they don't like themselves very well. And the best thing that you can do in those instances is just move aside and let them be. And know that there, you, you'll find a friend who will appreciate you for who you are. Because you deserve to be loved. And we're all lovable. And I think, and, and I really want young girls to know that I understand that it is harder to be a young girl, to be a teenager today than it ever was before. And, you know, I mean, when we read about what happens to young kids because of social media, I, I sometimes feel like social media has done such an injustice to our world. And, um, but you're lovable. Turn aside. Find somebody who can appreciate you because they are out there. Thank you so much, Karen. It's been really a treat to be in conversation with you today. And I know the whole Banyan community will really appreciate your presence here. Um, so I just, on behalf of the whole Banyan Books community, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. I so appreciated this opportunity. Thanks for joining us for Branches of Wisdom, a podcast of Banyan Books and Sound, Canada's spiritual and healing resource since 1970. Our podcast producer is Jacob Steele. The show is edited by Abdo Habani, and I'm your host, Ross McKeechee. Watch all our conversations on YouTube by searching for Banyan Books, or listen on your favorite podcast platform. Please subscribe, follow, like, and leave your reviews and comments. We love to hear from you. For all our live events, books, and more, visit us at banyan.com.